Earth's rules don't always apply to the Elder Scrolls games. The planet Nern is a completely fictional world ridden with what seems like a cop-out for almost anything scientific. Stars are holes in the sky, Lorcan's heart formed a volcano, the towers killed the rainforest. Mundus and Tamriel are described as being a creation of Lorcan and the Ada, and when their homies, the old Elenfey, arrived on Nern, it looked basically like we see it today. Sharp river valleys, volcanoes, land masses that look like they're diverging, but there's also a lot of evidence for things that just wouldn't have happened without real geological movements, as well as a region in the Skyrim literally named after continental rifting. So I'm going to talk about a few of them today and try to bring up some interesting lore that might help connect it all. I'm not going to talk about everything geologically cool in Tamriel, but I will go over what I think are some really interesting locations, and you might learn some geology along the way. So sit back and let's rock. Most of us know that the Earth is made up of a core, a mantle, and a crust, but Nern isn't anything like Earth, at least according to lore. Even the core of the planet is hinted as being made of clockwork and the home of Sothasil's clockwork city. There's also the problem of time. According to our sources, Nern, the planet, has only existed for about 7,000 years, so a lot of geology should be impossible. But even if Earth's rules don't always apply to Nern, we still have evidence of land movement in ancient environments all over the place. Just take the Nordic burial chambers. The earth has completely consumed Sarthal, and you even have some evidence of it in Bleak Falls Barrow. Or take a look at the Guardian and the Traitor, which says that Solstheim was once part of Skyrim's landmass. But the biggest thing I want to point to first are ores. You can't have ores without some movement of Nurn's crust. Ores appear all over the Elder Scrolls games, but I'm going to use Skyrim to talk about it just because I think it's a bit more fleshed out and there's a bit more to say about it. Ores are important to proving land movement for two reasons. First is that minerals are formed due to either sedimentation, magma, or intense pressure deep within the earth, all of which in some way rely on compression or movements of the earth over a long period of time. Second is that in the real world we can actually use the presence of mineral veins to date different layers of the earth. So say we get a collection of corundum ore surrounded by iron ore at a lower elevation. Well, because it's surrounded, we can determine that the iron ore is generally older than the corundum because newer land is generally at higher elevation. This is because earth layers are formed by deposits over time. The deeper the deposit, the older the layer. It's not always going to be this clear cut because of folding and plate tectonics, but for the sake of example, anytime we see iron ore, we can be pretty sure that this piece of earth is more than likely older than the places we see corundum. By the way, the map I'm going to be using a lot is a layered upon layered map originally by Tim Cook. Recently, a modder Kate's made it an in-game map, adding mineral locations. So. I gotta give credit where credit's due. They were really, really helpful to me in my research, and I'll be putting links to them in the description. What I did was I took Kate's map and turned the mineral markers into colored dots that I could layer on GIMP. So now we can clearly see where older parts of Earth containing iron match up with more recent parts containing corundum. You can use the same height map logic to guesstimate the age of other minerals in Skyrim. If you've looked up anything on geology in Skyrim, you've probably seen this really cool analysis of some Skyrim mineral dating by geologist Jane Robb, but we can take things a step further and use it to explain how Skyrim might have looked a long time ago. As an example, if we take the iron off the map, and even corundum, anything left over can help us hypothesize which mountains might have formed first, which could help us discern which rivers might have formed first, and so on and so on. It might even help us decide whether the thread of the world was formed by a volcano or by converging plates. You might have realized that dating rocks isn't always as straightforward. Iron appears at higher elevations all the time, but this actually isn't a flaw in geology logic. It's actually telling us more. This happens in the real world too. When the earth literally quakes, it shifts layers side to side, up and down all the time. Mineral layers shift with it, and with enough erosion, we get minerals appearing at a variety of depths. That iron ore vein is still older than the corundum, but it's been pushed above it. The corundum at Darkwater Crossing may have depleted deposited when the rift was forming, so there are a lot of factors at play here. You can use this to make all kinds of assessments, going through every Skyrim mountain range and dating everything to a game's science, but you're still going to run into some anomalies, like ebony ore. You do have Gloombound Mine, but otherwise ebony is pretty dang rare, and only really appears around this area of the map. If you've taken an earth science class, you might have heard of the three types of rock, and igneous rock are the ones formed by magma cooling into a crystallization. When an igneous rock is cooled 
cooled very quickly, it can turn into something hard and glassy like obsidian. When they cool slowly, they can come out like this gabbro or this pegmatite with chunks of things like biotite. Ebony ore appears all around volcanic areas. In Tess Morrowind, it's half the premise of why the Empire is settling around Red Mountain and Solstheim. And in the Elder Scrolls Skyrim, we see Raven Rock Mines still ripe with ebony ore deposits right around all this basalt. Basalt is also an igneous rock, a huge sign of volcanic activity. Activity. This is a good segue to what I really want to talk about next, which are volcanoes. East March's volcanic springs are no stranger to the seasoned Skyrim player, but take a look again where our ebony is. Now take a look at a map of Tamriel where our ebony is. There could feasibly be more ebony deposits in other places, but if ebony is strictly an igneous rock, Bethesda is really selling us on the idea that volcanic activity is or has been in this area. So why is there a large volcano here in Morrowind, but gradually less volcanic activity as we get towards High Rothgar? Some of you already know that volcanic Volcanoes are formed by magma releasing through vents or weak spots in the Earth's crust. But tectonic plates also interact with this. These hotspots can move with plate tectonics. It's the reason why there are so many inactive volcanoes in California, and now so many active spots in the Pacific Northwest. Hotspots don't actually move. The Earth moves. Hawaii is a great example of this. What's actually happening when a hotspot moves is that the Earth's crust shifts, while the magma chamber beneath stays put. Makes me really think of this section of Northern Tamriel. We have a very active hotspot here at Red Mountain, which I see trailed by less and less volcanic activity. Ignore the myths for a moment that Lorcan's heart formed Red Mountain and Ebony Ore are his tears. Look at this trail. We might even attribute these little hill stalks as remnants of ancient eruptions. If that's the case, is East March in an active volcanic area? What's with all these hot springs? Well, hot springs don't always have to indicate volcanic activity. Really, they can happen regardless. If groundwater gets deep enough into the crust, it's gonna heat up, which, if there's a clear vent, the heated water will rise to the surface. But as you can imagine, with magma a bit closer to the surface, this becomes much more common, and it can even culminate into the geothermal wonders of New Zealand, or the hot springs and geysers of Yellowstone. If there was volcanic activity though, how did it shape the landscape? Well, to answer that, we need to talk about the rift. Why do they call it the Rift, anyway? Well, rifts in the real world are connected with magma below the Earth, so this might actually support the hotspot thing even more. What happens is rising magma uplifts the Earth's crust and eventually causes the crust to split and diverge also called rifting. Volcanic activity can continue, and of course we have real-world examples of these rift valleys. These hillocks in East March are looking very sensible as evidence of rifting. The thing is, look at the surrounding area of East March, keeping in mind the volcano trail we talked about earlier. Steep cliffs over there, steep cliffs over there, a very, very steep cliff on that side, almost vertical. The rift zone isn't really clear to me. It almost seems like a hole. And if it's a hole, what in the name of Talos could create a hole like this? Well, it could have been a big old volcano. Happens in the real world. Check out Ngoro Ngoro Crater, or even recent before and afters of Mount St. Helens. So it's possible that East March is actually a caldera rather than a real rift valley. What the devs intended here is probably always going to be up in the air, but let's pretend East March was once a giant volcano. Was the throat of the world a remnant of that larger volcano? Is that why there's ebony up there? Put the lore back in with Red Mountain having magical properties. When East March was a volcano, did it possess the same magic that led the throat of the world to become one of the so called towers? A lot of interesting questions start popping up when you put the lore back in. It's possible that East March really is a result of continental rifting, and the volcano theory is maybe a little bit dramatic. It's possible that these mounds were once smaller rift volcanoes, and the steam pools are just normal aspects of a rift valley. But regardless of what happened to East March, the volcanic connection with Morrowind is undeniable to me. We talked a bit about how Skyrim might have looked a long time ago. If there was an East March volcano, or even a chunk of pre-rifted land, Skyrim as a whole would have looked completely different. The rivers, for one, wouldn't be flowing down to East March because 
gravity, the river flowing from Lake Ilanata might have not wrapped around High Rothgar, and because there was a mountain in the way, gravity might have formed a lake, or just sent the river towards Dawnstar. Maybe that would explain the little valley that we get on the road. Maybe that valley was formed by a lahar from one of Eastmarch's many eruptions. At this point, a lot of it is speculation, but it feels so plausible. There are some wonderful write-ups related to this on Tesslore from Nathan RH on how Skyrim might be geologically reimagined. Things like how in a geological perfect Skyrim, you'd have evidence of rocks from High Rothgar show up at the end of the White River in Windhelm. So what do you think? Do you have any Earth science that you've applied to Skyrim or other Elder Scrolls games? I'm really, really interested in hearing more if you've observed anything, and if there's a lot more to talk about, I'd actually be really, really interested in doing another video on this stuff where it's still kind of fresh in my mind. So thanks for tuning in, hope you learned something, and stay curious.